Hey, what's up everyone? I am Sharice Davis and welcome to Pineapple Talks. I am so happy to be able to cruise with Mr. Vladimir Lindor. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation today. How are you? I'm doing spectacular, two thumbs up, love and life. Yay, I'm very, very glad to hear that. So I wanna start um, by talking about the now phase of your life. So we're gonna talk about the now, then we're gonna talk about the then, and then we're gonna talk about the later. So one question I wanna ask you is, um, when you tell people, you know, the industry that you're in, do people get like really fascinated about it when they hear? Absolutely, they get fascinated. But you know, the number one thing they ask is, can I get a discount? Right. <laughs> That's the number one question I would say. Um, fascinated, like, wow, Marvel, like, wait a minute. And then when they hear I work for Carnival, they're like, oh, my goodness. Like, wow. Oh, my goodness. You know, so they're all like, okay, wait a minute. They want to know more. It's yeah. definitely um, an attention grabber, grabber, and I didn't realize how many people knows and familiar with, you know, the cruise line as a whole. So it always is an attention grabber. So always a conversation piece because people want to know more. And just when yeah. people think they know everything about it in the industry, they really don't fully know. So I always chime in and give my little two cents of feedback since I've been in cruising November of 2020 will be 20 years. Wow. Well, we want all of your two cents and we want you to give your two cents on the cruise industry. So can you just talk maybe a little bit about the history of it? Um, and then it's sort of connection to hospitality. Sure. Well, I'll go ahead and generally be brief because cruising can go on a little bit for a little minute um, because again, you just cruise back. on. Huh? Exactly. It goes <laughs> back to, I would say, you know, any area like the Nile River or the Egyptians when they used to go along. So it goes way back to that time period. That, of course, I don't want to share because I don't really have that much content. But I would say specifically, mm -hmm. um, cruising started as from a humble beginnings. Humble beginnings in the sense that it was specifically, specifically used as mail and cargo carriers. Mail and cargo carriers, um, as well as transportation. So means of transportation for immigrants and wealthy business owners to commute from North America to Europe, Europe and vice versa. So it started off simple like that. Um, and along the way, um, these wealthy business owners, you know, it began to be more of a status of, you know, if you had money, you could cruise, you know, yes. um, and again, that was a transportation piece solely. But of course, as the years progressed, as the years developed, again, when we talk about its beginnings, we're talking about the early, um, early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, so during that time period, you know, it was not a vast amount of options. Um, this was before the airline industry. So you know, the Federal Expresses and all these um, carriers, air, air carriers that we know of was non-existent um, right. because, in, you know, the airline started around, I guess, 1900, early, late, mid-1900, 1903 in that time period. So when we look at that, cruise industry began, as I mentioned, from humble beginnings. It wasn't really anything that anybody imagined would have gravitated. And even back then, when we talk about the history, back then, there was also what we would call a class system. Because again, you know, and a lot of people don't think about that. It's kind of, you know, I think it's relevant when we're talking about this day and age um, in the conversation um, of race and things like that. Something to always consider. I'm not necessarily saying that race played a part, but the wealthy, you know, the wealthy was the ones who cruised. If mm -hmm. you were not very wealthy or if you were not um, part of, a, worked for a business owner, probably you weren't going to be doing that. Um, you would find some other way of other means. Again, they have class systems. So that was something I always like to share with people because a lot of people weren't familiar with that. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, if you look at any movies, you'll kind of wonder why, why were that? That's what it was. Titanic. Very Viking much so. And I hate to hear that yeah. word, but, you know. Sorry. <laughs> but it's relevant. It's relevant in, in as a yeah. whole because you have to, um, because there's a reference of the class system in that. Anyone who's seen that movie, can attribute it. It's like, wow, why was that? Because that was the time period that it was back in the day. But now, how cruise industry has grown by leaps and bounds and transitioned, like, metamorphosisly, so no one would really, truly understand, like, wow, like, it was. It started as an industry, only the wealthy and the rich, now everybody can go. Yes. Whole families. Whole families, little people. Absolutely. <laughs> little people, yeah, Absolutely. Totally. Yes. 
Um, so in, in kind of still going off of history and connection to hospitality, are there any interesting stats or maybe any misconceptions that people have about cruises? Absolutely. Well, I always like to give a stat because one of the stats that I, I found very interesting, uh, which is from the CLIA, which is Cruise Line International Association, which is the world's largest trade organization for the cruise lines. Um, in actually 2018, um, as they highlight the year in review, about 49.9% of the North American public, which basically translates to over 14 million, have cruised. So wow. when we look at the numbers, you're like, wow. So that yeah. is basically about half of the North American public knows a little something about cruising. cruising. So they're not novice. So they generally have an understanding or exposure of that. Um, the average cruiser age is 47. Um, mm -hmm. And then they take cruises for an average of seven days. So when we look at those type things, you're kind of like, okay, it places things in perspective as far as vacations are concerned um, mm -hmm. and travel, what people, the trends are. A misconception that I always like to share um, and sometimes people, even in the industry, don't really understand it. Because somebody immediately I ask and I say, who do you think is the cruise line is, is let's say, Carnival's competitor? People say, oh, yeah, I can tell you. Oh, that's Royal. Oh, that's Norwegian. I'm going to say no. People are like, what? What? You see, exactly. People are like, what? Well, since you want to know why, I said yeah. that. <laughs> Glad you asked. <laughs> so because <laughs> most of the times, it's not the competitors because – once you've been on one cruise line, you've been able to uh, see, you know, you like certain things. You, it's going to incline you. The inclination is going to be to, you know, let me try another one. Let me, mm -hmm. you want to test, test the water. But our absolutely, our, our competitors are land-based. Disney, uh, Universal, uh -huh. they're our competitors because we want people to come on the cruise ships because the cruise ships are floating hotels. And as they're floating hotels... We want them to be exposed to the experience of the water, experience of um, our entertainment and so on and so forth, the eateries, um, the spa. Mm -hmm. So we have, we want them to expose them to that product. They can go on the, the, the land base. Sure, that's their option to do that state, the hotel's land base, but we want them to go on cruises. So a lot of people don't understand that. That's a misconception. People all immediately say, oh, well, Royals are competitive. Well, I'm just like, no, I tend to differ because once we get on on one, and you know, and this may be in years, you know, people, we do have loyal people who are loyal to certain cruise lines, and that's completely fine. But eventually, a cruiser will be a cruiser. They're going to want to be curious. They're going to want to try other lines. They want to try um, maybe even river cruises and so on and so forth. So it's going to incline them to want to stay on the cruise ship, not just say, oh, let me just go to Disney. Oh, let me just go to Land Bay. So right. it broadens and it strengthens the hospitality industry even further. Yeah. So on that note, two things I kind of want to deviate from that is I want to say that one of my, I've only cruised maybe t twice, maybe three times. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you love it so much. You can't remember. I'm going to go with two. I'm going to go with two. Those I can re distinctly remember that, but like my favorite part, it really is just the abundance of food. Like that's just, that is the absolute best thing ever. It's like, we there. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I'm really here for the food. Um, but I guess also going back to you speaking about the competitors um, and how it's not necessarily another cruise line, but rather, um, you know, land-based properties. Um, what are some of the, the, the brands and types of, I guess, cruising that's available? Or is there a difference between cruising and then, I guess, the carnival cruising and then like the riverboat cruising that you kind of referenced? Well, you see, I'm, I'm the type of person, and I'm not being political here, but I'm very careful in what I say. Although I've worked for this company for 20 years, mm -hmm. um, because I used to be in sales and because I'm very familiar with different cruise lines, I lean toward not even naming names because I always challenge people to say, you know what, who am I to say, hey, this may be better than this or another. It goes the same thing like movies. Some people say, hey, I hated that movie. The other person say, well, I love that movie. Okay. And you're like, did y'all watch the same movie? Yeah. Um, so in my mind is it's different strokes for different folks. So I always challenge people to, to test the waters, not even test the waters, but do your research. Yeah. So immediately I can just start saying, you know, some cruise lines are known for, you know, their freestyle dining where they can choose any time to eat. Others are known for their technology. You know, they'll have very innovations. They'll have um, technology where you serve bar um, by a robot, your drinks by with a robot. Um, others are option 
Yeah, there's I've so gotta, many different I things. I need to test the waters. That's what and I that's need. what I'm saying. A lot of people, <laughs> then there's other ones where, like I mentioned earlier about river cruises. And river cruises is, is a great opportunity for people to tap into a lot of the areas and not so touristy um, mm -hmm. where they can't. Because again, these big cruise ships can't make it down certain rivers, can't mm -hmm. go through these hidden gems. And that's what river cruises, their strength is, is because they're going to the not so populated, the untapped areas where you can see um, that you can see a lot of behind the scenes of areas and countries that you will never be able to see um, that river cruises can do because they're smaller, they're more concise, uh, more confined and uh, more intimate. Um, then you have other cruise lines where some target fun, you know, then you have others that they particularly promote longer itineraries, you know, exotic itineraries, you know, people like, really? There's cruise ships that go for 30 to 60 days? Absolutely. Yes. And people are like, really? But you see, <laughs> different shows with different folks. Yes. And even cruise lines that travel the world. You're like, are you kidding me? Yeah, there's an itinerary yes. called the world. Um, so a lot of people are like, are you kidding me? So these are things where I tell people, never limit your options. That's and again, true. you have some people that only want to cruise for three, two days. That's okay. Then you have yes. some that want to cruise for longer. So you just have to figure out what it is that you want and your time, your availability, and oh yeah, most important, how much do you want to spend? <laughs> because this makes a big part. You know, a lot of people don't understand a lot of the way the cruises are. Some cruise ships may have luxurious cabins. Some may just have basic. It also depends on what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So that's why I always tell people, I would be remiss as a cruise promoter to say, oh, I'm promoting this. Nope. I know yeah. a lot of people say, oh, you, I thought you were going to promote this carnival. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> it's because I'm a promoter of cruising. Um, being in the industry for 20 years, it has allowed me of many numerous opportunities to see different vessels, to see many different, you know, aspects of the cruise industry that you're mm -hmm. just, I'm till this day still wild. I'm wild at the number of eggs that they can make in a day. I'm wild by the number of bacon that's fried. So this is the things that a lot of people don't realize that there's so much going on on cruise ships. And for me or any person to say, oh, this one, I'd say, eh. I'd caution them to not pinpoint. Let the person be the deciding factor. And at that point, when they do their further research, then they'll know, okay, well, I like that one. That was where, where you wanted at that time. And then next one, okay, let me see if I can do something else, a little more intimate or a larger ship. So that's where I tell people, rather than me promote a specific line, I promote cruising as a whole. So you name it, there is something for you There's or anyone out there. That, that's one thing I can promise. Yeah, that was such a great... Um just a great insight into and I also feel like it's a life lesson too I mean I think that's just the whole principle of you know keeping your options open be willing to cruise it out check it out you know try something different and I love that you were just willing to say that I'm not going to just say do this line but so, to you know consider what works well for you and I think that kind of speaks to travel psychology and like why you know why people choose to go to the places that they choose to go to or why you know they choose one line over the other absolutely and then you you kind of touched on to like when you think about the, the cruise ship experience or um just how um how vast it can be and there are all these different departments so before we talk about how you specifically work within the carnival uh, line, tell us a little bit more about all the different areas that people can consider as potential job opportunities. Wow. That's a, when I say that's a loaded <laughs> question, question. <laughs> uh, it's a loaded because the, be the best thing way I can answer it is anything you see on land is on board mm -hmm. cruise ships. You're like, really? Okay. I said, let me, let's walk me for a moment. Um, those people say, well, I just want, I want to do law. There's no, no, you can't, I can't be an attorney, you know, on a cruise ship, not necessarily on a cruise ship, but the cruise line has attorneys, Aries. you know, people are like, oh, I didn't think about that. How about you? Know, I want to be a doctor. Y'all don't have doctors. Absolutely. We have both doctors shipboard and shoreside nurses, mm -hmm. um, you know, as well. So a lot of things people don't realize that culinary beyond belief, like, you know, Aries. from the ice carvings to the pastry chefs, to the sous chefs. You name it, all available on the cruise ships. Then you have those individuals who deal with the, I would say, the quote-unquote front desk, or as we sometimes oh, yeah. may call guest services or the guest relations desk as the front desk and the synonymous. They have to as well. They have the management team. They have the front desk clerks. They have those as well. Of course, then you have the housekeeping team. How does this, how does the ship get clean and maintained? Housekeeping mm -hmm. team. And don't forget, 
the ship. How does who drive the ship? Who's the driving captain. the ship? Somebody exactly. needs to the drive captain. the ship. And people say, well, I want to be an engineer. Well, how about the chief engineer? There's so many different aspects. You name it, on board. And oh, yeah, we need security as well. So they have a brig on board, too. People are like, really? There's so many different aspects and so many different avenues that one would not necessarily even think about. And if you say, well, you know what? I don't necessarily want to work on board the ship. You know, I just like to promote travel. Well, you could be perhaps one of our excursions. You know, sure, excursions. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have uh, something that you want to sell or promote as far as a particular location, a city, state, or country, you know, and tour, uh, sightsee that particular area. And when you sightsee in that particular area, you know about that. Tour guides, there's tour guides that's needed. You know, there's people to give tours of the areas. The tourism boards we work with on many different, on a regular basis. Um, and then from the governmental side, if you want to consider that as well, we work with U.S. embassies. Embassies that, you know, when people happen to forget their passport or they happen to have an emergency abroad, embassies are very important as well. So when I talk about anything land-based, it's available shipboard. There's some intertwining interconnection that works relating directly to the cruise ship. So it's such a enormous and vast, vast area of aspects. Again, call center from, you know, individuals who are sales, um, you name it, it's available on board cruise ships in some way, shape, or form. That's so fascinating. Like, I I mean, a few of those areas, I, I was like, oh, yeah, of course, quite naturally. But then I, I didn't even consider, you know, the the connection with the embassy. Like, like you know that oh, in the event that there's a problem, you know you need to have that relationship, you know, with Absolutely. them. But I not actually consider that, the, that there is somebody that could work for a cruise line that liaisons with the um, with the embassy. I just never thought that. Yeah, yeah. again, it's, it's so such a huge yeah. uh, a, a plethora of career options. Um, I always tell people, don't ever limit yourself. Um, you can perfect what I'd encourage them to do, perfect your craft, and then mm -hmm. that could be your, your end result, you know? But perfect mm -hmm. your craft is what I always, always encourage. And then, too, the, the neat thing is, is, I think when we say hospitality industry, people do maybe put things in a box. And so they would just think, oh, that's not my industry. But no, you actually have a skill that can benefit the industry. And so very, very great point. Because a lot you know, of people forget that. Who would want to be a doctor that gets to spend time on a cruise ship? Like, you know, like and can you imagine your patient patient base? Who what doctor yeah. can say they literally, although you're you're on a cruise ship, you have seen and you deal with, remember the doctors deal with not only the guests but they do with the crew as well. Oh, yes. That's a, that's a whole nother side that people don't yeah. consider. Think about the HR component. Who yes. hires all these people on board the ships? Who shipboard answer side? Who maintains? Who sees about them? There's so much strings attached to it um, that a lot of people don't realize that it's not just, okay, let's just put a ship out there. No, right. it's not that easy. It's a lot of behind the scenes that's mm -hmm. involved in that. Don't forget about the dancers, the entertainments. They play a huge part right. as well, you know. So this is a very, very key thing. Um, product, you know, again, spa services. There's so much to go on about that. When you talk about that, cruise directors, who's the life of the cruise ship? You know, so yeah. these are the things people don't realize. They're like, I didn't think about that. So yeah. this is why I always tell people, don't ever limit your options because just when you limited your option, you've missed that option. That's, that's a whole word right there. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's good. <laughs> that is... I'm telling you, if people not getting into the industry, they're going to get delivered, though, through this conversation. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about what you're, so you've been in the cruise industry for 20 something years, but how, where, how, what are you doing? What are you doing now? I mean, I know it's COVID, but I guess maybe pre-COVID, what, you know, what was, what were your work hours like, you know? <laughs> Well, to give you a behind this little bit behind what happened pre-COVID, um, in my current position, I'm a family support specialist and a trainer. So as a family support specialist, I deal with the emergencies. People are like, what? What happens on a cruise ship? What? Yeah, so I deal with all of the emergencies. We all know things happen on cruise ships. Well, We've seen a lot them. of people you'll be surprised <laughs> don't know. You'll be surprised. So what happens on board the cruise ship, a lot of people don't truly realize that, you know, sometimes people miss the ship. They're either having too much fun no. at Carlos and Charlie's or they're drinking a little too much and they looked at the time yeah. and it wasn't ship time, it's their own time. Um, then you have the individuals who 
may have been medically disembarked for whatever particular reason, pre-existing condition, those individuals who may have had an accident on board the ship or sure side. Um, then you have those situations where, unfortunately, if do, guests do pass away, um, what do you do? What department is there to help? And that's where my department comes into play. Um, we, we're called Care Team Services. And in my role, we work with all of the ships in our fleet um, to assist the guests um, in addition to in any emergency. In addition to emergencies, um, we're specifically speaking about, um, no problem. <coughs> so sorry. No, no problem. You all right? All right. Sorry about that. It was like a tickle all of a sudden in my throat. <laughs> no, no, I understood. understood. Um, in addition to just the regular emergencies I just mentioned, it could be a ship fire, ship listing, okay. or ship catastrophe, or what have you. Our department is there to mobilize team of volunteers to actually go to the ships and help coordinate op that operation. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of my role. The other part of my role is a trainer. So all these things I just mentioned to you, who trains the volunteers? Who trains the shipboard yeah. people to handle in time of crisis? How to handle somebody who's, you know, suffered a loss? You know, should I tell them, are they okay? Is that all right? You know, or should I approach them with caution and ask them, who can I get, you know, to help them during this time? And that's where my responsibility is as a trainer to train board the shipboard and the shoreside employees and volunteers to help the guest or team member in time of crisis. So those are the things that people are like, really, how did you get that? So it's one of those things that people don't realize it exists. Um, mm -hmm. and we have a specific department solely based on that to help during that time of crisis. Because it's not when it happens, you need to try to but, get somebody. But it's right. if it happens. Because I tell yeah. people, and I hate people when they get, when I tell them, they're like, don't say that. It's not a matter of if something if, happens. If, but it's when. Matter. It's when. So when it happens, you're not going to mobilize at that time. You should already have a team designed and ready to help and facilitate those things in that particular manner. So that's pretty much what I have been doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, I work with both shipboard. Um, you know, I speak with captains, HR directors. You know, they're mm -hmm. calling me on how to handle, how to navigate this particular um, emergency that they may, may be having involving a guest or even a crew member. Um, mm -hmm. So we deal with all of the emergencies, you name it, any kind of emergency we deal with. <laughs> yes, any wow. kind of emergency. Um, and even the emergencies where somebody gets a phone call from home saying that their house was on fire. Wow. You know, we, we train our call center in the individuals to how to handle specifically those things. And if we're needed, we would get involved when the ship lets us know, hey, this guest is a little, you know, emotional about this. We, we can get telephonic counseling available for the guests. So there's a whole nother component that people don't consider when it comes to that. So that was all naturally pre-COVID. Um, that's pretty much what we do on a regular basis because we do value our guests um, at the utmost because we realize that when something happens, they're, they're low, they're on vacation. During that time period, they're on vacation and they're our guests at that time. So we want to make sure that we take that as much as care of, of them as best as possible. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm going to pause really quick because I'm still choking. <clears throat> Uh, where's the pause? So I want to um, now follow up to what you were talking about in terms of what you're doing now. Well, pre-COVID now. Um, but just kind of what was your process to getting into that, that role? You know, um, were you kind of always in this capacity within the, within the cruise uh, field? Or did you kind of make your way through other opportunities to get to this role? Good question and good, you know, thing to consider. Um, when I originally began with my career at Carnival, I started out as a reservation um, agent, taking calls with travel agencies, making bookings, servicing bookings, so on and so forth. Um, during that particular time period, the company did have um, um, solicit volunteers for, you know, emergency response. Just volunteers is something that generally most cruise industries, cruise lines have something uh, similar or synonymous. They may call it differently. Um, we call it care team. Um, mm -hmm. So at that time, they had volunteers available. I initiated, put in my request for it. And then you go through a, at the time, it was a two-day specialized training. This is the same training that I mentioned earlier that I was part of, but now I am the trainer of. Um, so um, I was, you know, took a lot from that and, um, you know, used that. So then I moved to my another career part. When I mentioned, I went to sales. So mm -hmm. during that time period, as a regular employee, 
I was exposed to the opportunity of helping guests and or crew members, team members in time of crisis as well. So during that specialized training, um, I would basically, you know, get approval from my manager if there was an emergency to step away while I'm still working with the company to step mm -hmm. away to help during a particular emergency. So of course, I've deployed numerous, numerous amounts of times helping mm -hmm. guests, crew members along the way. Uh, and then when you consider, you know, different options, this is where a lot of people don't realize within organizations, within companies, both cruise industries and as a whole, there are other different avenues and different programs, volunteer organizations, volunteer opportunities that the companies have within themselves. So I always challenge people to look within the companies. But of course, you have to be part of the company in order to know it. Um, so that was one thing. And along the way, you know, they happened to be hiring for this particular position. Um, I said, OK, let me apply for it. And yes. I always, I, I share the story with people. People are like, really? Okay. Oh, you got it. I said, no, that's not what happened. I didn't get it. No. I so people was like, it. what? They was like, wait a minute. You're not telling I thought he was like, yeah, I applied and I got it. And I just yeah, knew people that was it was like, what? Me. You're not telling the story. No. Like, well, why are you, what's the purpose of telling the story? You didn't get it. I said, well, there's a lesson in that. Mm -hmm. So ironically, the same person who was my coworker, he got it before me. We were staying in the same department. And although he was not part of the volunteer organization. Hmm. So little did I know, he came to me and said, hey, he wanted interview skills on to talk about it. And I gave it to him. And so you he got helped it over me. Oh. Yeah, he and got he it got over me. So then a funny thing happened along the way. So, you know, of course, this is why I tell people when you're resilient, be resilient. Don't just be powerful. So, oh, man, oh, hey, no, no, no. What I did, I continued what I was doing in sales, excelling as I always normally do. Six months later, I got a phone call saying, hey, you want that position again? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. What ended up having that same person who beat me out of the interview, it wasn't what he <laughs> wanted <laughs> because he didn't know enough about it. So in reality, what's for you is going to be for you. So I tell people, you always be resilient. You do as you are led to do. Don't, you know, pop an attitude. And, you know, that can have an impact, uh, impact upon what you're ever getting in the future. So just be resilient and keep moving forward. And if it's for you, it's going to be there. But don't mess it up. You can mess it up, too. Yeah. Which, are there any learning curves or any challenges that have been along the way in this particular uh, phase of working in the cruise line? Not, not necessarily COVID, but just kind of talking about with the role that you have, were there some things that like, oh, man, I didn't know that or I didn't really you know, any situations that were, that were learning curves, really, that's kind of what I'm asking. Absolutely. If you are a professional and you work <laughs> in corporate America or with the public, those incidents will happen. Some more than you want, some you don't expect, it will happen. You know, um, I think when you, when, you, when you wake in the morning, it's a learning experience. Yeah. because um and that's where you have to embrace it so in reality huge amount of learning learning experiences i could think of uh, one particular situation where i was working with a family who had lost their child um of course you want to be as sensitive as possible um and one of the things i, I happen to tell people not to say i end up saying and i got the look of death from this family and i'm like oh like it was a learning curve because again that's why i tell people talk is cheap you know when you're in a situation you have to practice what you preach don't talk about it, be about it. And when you're about it, you will kind of like, oh, so now you understand. Because unless you've experienced something specifically, it will cause you to say, okay, I know I will never say that again. Yeah. Because it's kind of like a reality check for you. Um, but that's among one of many, many different situations, both professionally, um, mm -hmm. you name it. I mean, anytime as a whole, um, I can't reiterate enough about social media. I can't reiterate enough about email courtesy and, um, yes. you know, things. Just different, many different things. I think one, I can remember another situation where somebody told me, oh, you shouldn't bold or, um, you know, capitalize something. I'm like, well, I'm just, I'm not yelling at them, but little did I know in other cultures, it comes across as you're comes shouting and yelling at them. So yeah. I didn't realize that. And, you know, I'm like, wow, I didn't think it was nothing big, but there's a whole lot of learning lessons to learn. You just have to take it. It's going to mm -hmm. require some humility because you, you, sometimes you may think you were right and you were trying to make your point, but in reality, you have to look at it from the other person's perspective. How was, it, how was it received? So that's why a lot of times it's just a matter of perception. You have to consider someone else rather than just yourself because you see it in one way, but the other person completely is like, I was offended. I'm like, well, that wasn't my intention. So you have to be very uh, forthcoming and honest and humble yourself a lot of the times. Yes, that's good points. Good points there. And when you think, 
about your experiences that you've had in this role. Um, what have been some of your, I guess, highlights and memorable experiences, memorable on the positive side, like where you were like, man, I love this job. I can remember, again, the same family that I was, thought I was doing all the right things. I made one particular minor mistake and something I said, they were so grateful because they realized, you know, um, they were humbled. You know, they had lost their son during this particular situation. And, um, you know, they, they were without words, you know, but I became their thought process. I became their eyes, ears, and their brain. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't know what to do. They didn't know if they should eat. They didn't know if they should drink. So little things like that. And along the way, I was guiding them the whole process, not boastful yeah. for myself, but it was something that I didn't realize, you know, wow. So at the end of it, um, you know, the time that we were leaving, we were going our separate ways. Um, you know, the mother, I thought, you know, because she, she really took a liking to me. Um, she even offered to cook for me. When I'm like, what? You want to cook for me? Because again, we, we, we have, yeah, I'm like, me? Well, again, um, a lot of times I tell people because I like to eat and, you know, I didn't realize how much they were listening because you realize, you think, wow, they're not listening. I'm just going to share them. They're not listening. I'm just passing time. But they were listening. So that was humbling in itself. And then at the end of the day, they ended up sending me a, a, a quilt, uh, a thank you quilt. You know, they went out their way, a personalized thank you quilt. So that was something that I'm like, wow, you know, you know, some people, oh, that's not much. No, it wasn't, it was the gesture. Like in the midst of their crisis, they didn't have to send anything to me. They didn't even need to say thank you. But in the midst of that, they were considered it enough to acknowledge me during their, you know, sad time. So I'm like, wow. So that was something like a highlight for me. I'm always um, wowed when somebody in the midst of a crisis forgets mm -hmm. themselves and manages to say thank you. Even something simple yeah. as writing a thank you letter Mm -hmm. During somebody having experienced a crisis, that's the least of their worries. Yeah. They perhaps may have a funeral, may have to go through counseling, and then they're thinking to send us a thank you. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. the last thing I would think of. Yeah. Wow. So that's it's definitely the... very hum humbling. Um, it just allows you to say, wow, you know, like you, you just don't realize. It just makes you really appreciate and you say, wow, you know what? They're not, you know, in the midst of this chaotic world and so much, you know, hatred there are really a lot of nice people out there, believe it or not. And that's what I try to tell people. Don't always look for the bad. The bad is going to come. I tell, try to find the good in every single thing you do because the bad will always be there. Trust me, it'll always yeah. be there. But the good is what people challenge and they have a hard time finding. Even in a bad situation, find the good. Then you'll be like, mm. okay, yeah, he was right. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of the bad, <laughs> uh -oh. one of the challenges that the entire world has been dealing with is COVID-19. So just kind of, you know, as much as you can share, share about how you personally are managing this. And then also um, for, you know, for the company that you work for, um, for what you can share, how are you all managing and responding? Well, very good question, and it's irrelevant during this time. Um, mm -hmm. Reality speaking, it's been an unprecedented um, time for the entire cruise industry, industry specifically. Um, of course, our operations has, has paused. Um, mm -hmm. It has been paused since, if my memory serves me correctly, March. Yes. Um, so can you imagine a leading industry um, with 14 million people and I, I could barely even give you the amount of millions and billions of dollars uh, wow. er, earned in a year. Can you imagine from March to our current time period? Yeah. Not and these are summer the, months, you know, like. Correct. <laughs> so a huge and unprecedented um, time. This is unfortunately making history in a negative respect. Mm -hmm. um, no one really, honestly, you know, a lot of companies don't necessarily know how to manage this. They're managing it on a day-to-day -day basis because it's unprecedented, not having to know what to do, having to, you know, thin out your employees, um, yeah. having to, it's been a huge unprecedented um, time for everyone. But at the end of the day, the cruise industry still, they're using, utilizing this as an opportunity to just do a lot more enhancements, enhancements as far as look at policies, look at what's going on, what are we doing, look at the soon to be, you know, whenever we do reopen. What are our protocols going to be like? Mm -hmm. um, just looking at the entire operation, we continue to work with government to, you know, a lot of different governments of the different countries, because this is where a lot of people forget. The challenge in the cruise industry is we work with different countries. It's not just one country. People are like, really? Yeah, we work with different countries. So although the CDC is part of the United States, but guess what? 
we work with other countries as well. Um, all, of, all their people, all of their... Exactly. A lot of people <laughs> forget that. You know, a lot of people don't realize that the cruise industry is probably one of the most highly regulated industries out there because we deal with so many different integrals, um, officials, governmental, you name it. Um, yeah. And they can, you know, from health officials, you know, sanitation, you name it. Um, and we have to be in compliance at any given time. So mm -hmm. as many times people forget that, um, I always challenge people to say, well, we are probably, the cruise industry is a very regulated industry. So in the midst of COVID-19, we're having to look at everything. Just look at everything, how we manage our team members, how we manage our guests, looking at our protocols, looking at our ships, doing, you know, increased sanitation, environmental concerns, you name it. We're looking at it. We're doing it. We're changing. We're updating, um, upgrading, you name it. So that's mm -hmm. the best way to, you know, to answer that as far as that's concerned. But there's, they're, they're not just sitting around. People are not just sitting around doing nothing. But yeah. keeping in mind, you know, those who are still around, they still have employment. They still have, you know, duties and responsibilities to attend to. You know, they have, you know, even the, the ships. So people are like, well, the ships don't have anybody. Well, actually, they do have what they call manning, you know, uh, to manning regulations. And what manning regulations basically is, they have what is managed, able to manage the ship at that particular time. So it may be a limited number of crew members, you know, the captain, the team members still there. They're still chefs cooking. They're still, you know what I mean? They still have to function because they have crew members on board. Um, so the operation still manages, um, which is a challenge of a whole. Because remember, you know, this industry is not taking anything. Right now, it's just dispersing. Yeah, dispersing, yeah. Absolutely. So that's the huge challenge. Um, and yeah. I always, always, you know, it's, it's, it's just unique as a whole. Um, but again, I think what I always tell people, uh, the best way to climax, you know, this particular question is I tell people, um, if you think back to World War One, World War II, um, the airline industry coming, what industry was still around? The cruise industry. Yeah. Um, people were like, really? I said, yes, the cruise industry was still around. They yeah. made it through the World Wars. They yes. made it through the airline industry when, and remember, as I mentioned in the beginning, the airline industry, when that came around, that kind of challenged the cruise industry because they mm -hmm. were solely the mail carriers. They were the cargo carriers. And mm -hmm. now the airline industry kind of, Swooped that and took that away from them. So mm -hmm. the best way I tell people is, as Arnold Schwarzenegger's famous words is, "I'll be we back." We'll be back, you know. And yeah. I tell you, we will be back. <laughs> um, you know, and I always challenge people because at the end of the day, um, yeah. this industry was birthed for resilience. You know, mm -hmm. can you imagine going through world wars? Like, can you imagine? Like, yeah. how do you manage that? Water um, is there. <laughs> yeah, so it's there and it's been there. So yeah. we, we, we're just resilient. You know, this is just a pause, you know, kind of like when you're playing a good song and somebody just happens to pause it. That's the best way I would describe it. They happen to pause in the middle of your groove and you're like, oh, no. Why yeah. You pause it? <laughs> so it kind of bothered you, you know, rubbed you the wrong way a little bit. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, eventually we're going to, you know, put the play, push the play back. But right now we're still on pause. Yeah. That's a great summary. And I think that there's some life lessons that can come out of that too. In that, um, you know, that the whole idea of reflecting and resetting and thinking about, okay, how do I need to do life, do life differently going forward? And Absolutely. so definitely some, that's a nut, like a few nuggets there too. We've just been getting yeah. all time nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to go back in time a little bit and just kind of hear about your upbringing, where you're from, and how that led you to where you are today. You know, I also really want to know when you were younger, did you did you have any inkling that you would be in hospitality um, or working with cruises? Wonderful. Great question. So I'm originally from Miami, Florida, you know, 305. Ah. <laughs> There's some ports down. There's a port down there, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so originally from Miami, Florida, went to Miami Norland Senior High School. Um, when I was about 15, 16, um, well, I'm going to backtrack for a little moment. Um, my family's from Haiti. So family being from Haiti and part of the Haitian or Caribbean culture is that and they, their, um, their perception of success is a doctor, a lawyer. You're successful if you're a doctor or a lawyer. That's something I was grown up into, reared into, drilled in my head. So I idolized, you know, Bill Cosby back in the time when he was good. Um, you know, I leave that alone. I idolized yeah. him. But I'm never ashamed in admitting that because, yeah. you know, he was an obstetrician. I wanted to be a doctor. You know, people are like, really? OBGYN? That's something I wanted to do. I was fascinated with childbirth, fascinated with, you know, that whole operation. I loved it. 
Um, mm -hmm. So it was something I took a liking to, you know, try to try to concentrate a little bit more on that. So I just loved all of that. So along the way, um, I was exposed to a what they call the, um, an enhancement program, which with the National Academy Foundation. And what the National Academy Foundation is now, it's grown into what they call magnet programs. Um, and magnet program at the time was being offered um, for, you know, a particular area that I was at, and they promoted to Academy of Travel and Tourism. So I said, hey, you know what? I like to travel, you know, when I signed over, I like to travel, but I'll be honest, I was like, I like to eat. So if I get, I can like to eat, let me go ahead and eat or travel. That's what I wanted to do. So I'm being really honest with you with that. <laughs> so in this enhancement program, you know, was in my um, sophomore year of high school, started it, enjoying it. And along the way, I had this aha moment. That aha moment was like, wait a minute, why do you really want to be an obstetrician? Of course, other than pleasing your mom or your dad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I kind of fine-tuned in this program that I just like helping people. Mm -hmm. So that was the only reason why I wanted to be an obstetrician was because I like helping people. And mm -hmm. people were like, okay, so I was able to fine-tune that and realize that that was exactly what I wanted to do. So in that National Academy Foundation, um, I was there until uh, my senior year. It exposed me to internships. It exposed me to another world, uh, the interworking of the travel hospitality industry that I had never clue, had no clue. Because in the Haitian culture, they said, no, I don't want you to be in the travel because you're going to be a travel agent or uh, you're going to be, you know, a hotel or something very simple and minimalist. It was mm. all very minimizing. And it was like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to be a travel agent, you know. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with it. But in my mind, I'm like, I had no clue. But again, I was just introduced to it a lot. But yeah. then along the way, I found out that I had a passion for airlines. I just loved the flying. I loved it. It yeah. wasn't anything you can tell me about a plane, an airport that didn't get me all excited and worked up. So I happened to get an internship with Miami International Airport. Um, and thankfully, that internship grew into every year. I ended up going back for about maybe four years. Um, so that exposed me to this so much. This is before college. Before college. Okay. People are like, really? Yes. So I always tell people, there are so many different programs. Expose your kids out there. Don't limit them. Don't think, oh, no, no, you just never know. It, you know, get, get them into anything and everything. Because, mm -hmm. again, if it's free, hey, go for it. Um, so along the way, I was exposed to the internship. I got the internship. I was a tour guide at the airport. Um, so I exposed myself to a lot of behind the scenes of the airport operations. So then I determined, I said, you know what? I want to be an airport manager. Hey, airport manager, station manager, airline. I knew I have a full understanding of the whole aviation and airline industry. Because the whole airport exposed me to so many different things and careers. I just loved it. Um, so literally, I, I did all of that. So I graduated from high school, decided to go Johnson Wales, um, exposed me to so many different things. Again, aviation was the only thing on my mind. The mm -hmm. entire four years at Johnson & Wales University was only aviation. I knew I was exposed to travel and everything like that. Um, you know, it was part of the internship that we went to Australia. One of the only one time we went there. It was amazing. Wow. Um, we planned that whole entire thing again along the way. I love the airlines. Aviation was the only thing yeah. on my mind. Got to the point where after Johnson Wells, I said, you know, I'm even going for my master's. Went to Embry Riddle Aeronautical University, working on my master's. People are like, really, Mr. You better go for it. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I well, I have a friend that went to school there, so I'm like, oh, Embry Riddle, Ralph. Yes, you said you remember exactly. Yeah. So I went there for about about a year about a year or so, uh -oh. then a funny thing happened along the way. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You know, adversity. So I got called into the financial aid office. I'm thinking, okay, you know, the lady gave me said, she was like, oh, well, um, one of your loans didn't go through. I said, well, find another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was like, no, no. She was like, so I don't think you understand. Um, you either need to pay us $9,000 or you don't come. I'm like, oh, hold on. Let, let me just write you a check. I said, you know I'm here on student loan. What? what I don't have that. She was like, so she gave me an ultimatum. So oh my goodness. in giving me an ultimatum, it was like, well, so much for my time. But I still to this day don't know. But again, I, I don't want to digress. I'll get back to that. So I, you know, brush, shrug, shrug my, brush my shoulders off and say, okay, go ahead. And I said, I was going to, I was determined to pay off that bill, the Embry Riddle, <laughs> to go back into the aviation industry. But things didn't work the way I thought it was going to be. So my mother said, if you're not finished paying for that, by August, I'm coming to get you. August came around, and so I yeah. had to humble myself, and I came back to Miami. But again, things happen the way it's supposed to be for a reason. 
So back when I started my career at Johnson & Wales, um, uh, there was not a North Miami campus. So yeah. there was not a North Miami campus. But when I came back from Every Riddle, there was. And they happened to be having a career day. And I said, let me just go. Let me go. What are the chances of me really, you know, uh, doing anything or learning something from that? So I went to this career day. Carnival Cruise Line was hiring for two positions, a reservation yeah. agent and a sales position. I told myself, I'm not no sales agent, so let me just take this $8 an hour position reservation because I need money. Cool. Mm -hmm. Little did I know I got the job. Little did I know years later that same sales position I didn't want, it was given to me. I didn't interview. Wow. It was given to me. And wow. that summarizes my entire, I'd say, career and, you know, as a whole. So I tell people I'm a walking, moving, reading testimony of resilience, um, mm -hmm. of going, overcoming adversity. Um, so just when you think it's your end, you, it's never your end until yeah. you say um, So I challenge people, um, you may start off one way and it may end up another. But mm -hmm. the thing is to have a plan. You got to start off somewhere. Yeah. Um, and in that process, you know, the plans have to change. So you have to be yeah. able to have your plan A, plan B, C and even D. Um, <laughs> and if all those things don't fall, you better have start getting work on an E. You just have to work yeah. for it as it gets to that particular time. Um, so my career did not originally start as in hospitality. It never did start off as hospitality, but it moved into that direction when I had a better understanding, which is why it's so important where people understand the psychology of travel um, and just self. Um, knowing self, um, being um, part of uh, self-assessments, what are your skill traits, um, your skill sets, what are you strong in? Because sometimes you may want to be something, but that may not be what that's not your is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's not your path. So in, along the way, you have to realize that. But I realized that early on that I love travel. There wasn't nothing you could tell me about travel I didn't love. It was nothing. So that was one thing that I told myself I finalized that. So I always challenge people, finalize what you're passionate about. You know, a lot of times people have friends to this day. They've studied masters, all this stuff. They're like, I don't even like what I do. I'm thinking like, what? You don't yeah. even like it? I yeah. think you don't have to be passionate or love it, but you don't even like it? I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, no, I said, you paying student loans off of that? No, no, right. no, not me. So I always challenge people, go with what you love, what you're passionate about. Because at the end of the day, your passion will drive you along the way. So thankfully, I'm in my passion. I'm loving life. Um, so I'm just thankful. I'm humbled in the midst of it all. Yes. I mean, just so much wisdom, so much wisdom too. I'm really, really um, excited that I'm gaining from this. And then I know anybody that listens is going to gain from this too. So just to kind of bring this to a close, I want to hear about the later phase of your life. I know you're not quite in the later yet, but that's next. That might be the, the C, D, E, F, G plan. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but just kind of, you know, if you could decide whatever you want that later to be, what does that look like for you either personally and, and or ca career wise? Wonderful. Um, well, I've checked off one mark from my, my list, um, uh, of that EDF was being a homeowner. So thankfully over about maybe close to two years ago, it's going on two years in March next year, I'm a homeowner. So that was something I told myself. Um, I wanted to do. It even caused me to move further away from where I'm from. I moved an hour and 30 minutes from where I was. I'm like, really? So, but I have what I want. So yeah. um, that's one. Um, secondly, I would say as far as career-wise, um, the hospitality industry will always be part of my passion. I love it. Um, uh, I, I just think there's hospitality in everything we do. Um, one thing that I've kind of really along the way learned that I have a little more passion for now, acquired passion, is emergency management, mm -hmm. um, which is what I've been exposed to, as well as HR. Two mm -hmm. areas that I think can enhance a little bit more hospitality. People are like, really? Absolutely. I mm -hmm. think in emergency management, sometimes um, emergency management professionals, they're robotic in how they yeah. handle processes. And people are like, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, those individuals who deal with emergencies and uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, mm -hmm. um, they're dealing with masses. And I realize that. Um, but there is a way sometimes in how you can train people to be more empathetic, um, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just processing. Right. Um, and see that they're helping people. Like, we're not bingo. fixing necessarily a system. We're, like, helping people. Bingo. Yeah. And something um, someone, someone did, I won't even say their name, 
um, you know, <laughs> that just a like person. throwing throwing um paper towels to individuals, something of that simple a nature can be so offensive and degrading for somebody that you don't realize why can't you just hand it to them you know yeah. that's just where you know something simple like that people are like really yeah just something simple like that handing something to them gives them self-pride and self-worth and it right. helps them and that's hospitality when you realize when you summarize it you're really being hospitable even in the midst of covid you know we may be wearing a mask or whatever you can still leave it on the table and say i've left that for you very simple and how you do things moving forward is something um, and again, HR is another thing that I'm really more passionate about. Um, along the way, I've learned overall, just dealing with HR professionals, just not necessarily in the cruise industry, just overall, that mm -hmm. they're just so morbid. Um, they're so rigid. Um, and I'm like, you know, I get it. You may have to sometimes terminate somebody. You may have to sometimes, you know, give some type of a scolding type of information. But you can do it with, you know, a little bit of a smirk or a smile, not just overzealous, but you can do it with a little concern or regard. You know, you know, just show some kind of hospitality that they're human, they're to be respected. So that's another avenue that I'm passionate about. So I can see myself pursuing further careers or further ventures. Um, I did complete my master's degree in emergency management. Wow. Um, so I am a master's degree recipient of emergency <laughs> management. That was just finished in June. So kudos. Congrats. Uh, thank you. Thank wow. you. Wow. Um, so Recent that's something. accomplishment. Absolutely. Um, that's something that I told myself that um, um, my career in emergency management thus far has exposed me to so many different things um, as far as that's concerned. So, and, you know, going back to your question specifically, you know, I see emergency management, emergency management, um, perhaps federally, you know, more on a larger scale or whatever opportunity. But I've learned again, as I shared, I don't limit any options, you know, so whatever options avails me in my present location, I'm mm -hmm. going to avail myself of that as much as possible. But I always challenge people, after a certain point in your career, you do have to set a plan for retirement. Yes, we do. Um, you know, that's one of those things that I'm, I'm 44 years of age, and I never would imagine that would even be partaking my mouth at any given time. <laughs> um, you're like, really? Yeah. So, um, because yeah. you know, you're going to work yeah, but you have to plan. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and it goes to the same. It sounds like a cliche, but again, if you do not plan, you fail you to fail plan. To plan. Mm -hmm. and that's going to be a failure and you don't want to have no one ever wants to be a failure so even in your starting of your career i always challenge people begin to put that in your mindset um does this organization or an organization have a 401k what's their retirement options you know what i mean um you know that way you know it allows you so much more i am of the school of thought because my parents reared me where i specifically like to stay in one career one place and go from there mm -hmm. But I realized along the way that um, HR professionals don't necessarily see that as marketable. I'm like, really? Um, because that's the new trend. So whatever the trend is, I tell people, you just engulf yourself in whatever your now is. But look for whatever the benefits of that organization can offer for you in the mm -hmm. long term. You know, because again, sometimes you may say, oh, I'm only going to stay here for one year. But if they got good benefits, you better tough that out a little bit longer. <laughs> um, so benefits outweigh a whole lot because... How are you going to sustain your family, your future, mm -hmm. and all, and so on and so forth? Yeah. Wonderful professional advice. And I think that's going to be very beneficial to uh, definitely students that will hear this. Uh, and then also just people who are wanting to make a change in their career or if they're mm -hmm. in a place now where they're like, oh, I just can't anymore. Maybe that will, what you just shared will be that nudge to just to hang in there. So. Uh, this has just been so exciting. My Thank pleasure. You. I'm loving it. So I wish I could be there good. with somebody having a I, lecture because I would love that. <laughs> I know. Well, I will definitely keep in touch with you because there will be other opportunities um, to, you know, to have you, you know, speak to my students and who knows, more opportunities are going to open up for you to talk to other students um, as well. So thank you so much. Again, this is Vladimir Lindor. Isn't his name like amazing? <laughs> um, thank you so very much. You had some uh, great insight to share into the cruising industry. You My pleasure. Shared some of your personal story, which is inspiring. And I wish you all the best in these next phases of your life. Absolutely. And um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. You're so, so welcome.